morning, everyone. Good morning. It is a delight to see you all today. We are continuing our sermon series in the Gospel of John. Today we'll be reading from John 2, verses 1 to 12, a story where Jesus turns water into wine. It goes like this. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone jars of water, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some of it out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bride and groom aside. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. I, I think that my, my copy of this uh, is, is leaving out of verse. Um, First he did not realize where it come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Uh, then called the bride from the side and said, Everyone bring, brings out the choice wine first, then the cheaper wine after the guests. have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. So that's important, so I didn't want to exclude it. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. The word of the Lord. They had no more wine. And this failure cultivated a looming sense of dread. Jewish weddings could go on for days and days. And running out of provisions for the guests could carry a significant amount of shame. Possibly even legal ramifications. Guests would have traveled many miles at great personal expense. And to arrive to dry wine casks would be, in my mind, as bad as arriving to a tropical vacation, having booked your hotel months in advance only to find out that the rooms were all full. But notice the shameless persistence of this bride and groom in this wedding. This unnamed, undescribed couple who launched into their wedding without enough wine. They fall so dramatically short of having enough wine, in fact, that when the master of the banquet tastes the wine, he and everyone else are still pretty much sober. There is a strength to the bride and the groom. They get married without letting their need stop them. They get married in front of their friends and family, dressed in robes of black and fine garments of vulnerability. The whispers of their kinsmen, a painful cacophony of judgment, putting their hands over their faces, too weak to bear the glory of this couple, the naked, lacking glory. The bride and groom seem unfazed by this, however. I sat for a long time with these words. They had no more wine. The fact is that they decided to go on with their wedding, 
despite a key component missing. They would have known. They would have known that there wasn't enough. This, for many of us, constitutes irresponsible foolishness. Having counted the cost, the couple moves forward with seeming disregard for the shame that they will bring on themselves and their family. Perhaps more foolishly, they also appear to move on without joy. Wine is the drink of a celebration. It flushes cheeks and it warms hearts when taken in moderation, and it's a social lubricant, a small talk doorway at parties. It was not, in Jesus' day, the kind of taboo that it's become for Christians today. Wine was in many ways the foundation of a celebration, and the Apostle John treats it that way in his story. And so they had no more wine is as much an indictment against the couple as it is their party. A joyless, or in the words of our story, a wineless marriage is a tragedy. And the symbolism of a wineless wedding does not bode well for this couple. The lack of wine, as mundane as it may seem, was a profound risk on this couple's part. They risk their relationships with the people attending, and even their very wedding. Why? Why would they risk that? Imagine if they risked this and hoped that their love would be enough. Here we find this image of what makes love meaningful. It gazes on the naked lack of the beloved and in faith casts itself into their arms, not with naivety, but rather with eyes wide open. And this imagery draws me to wonder if John might be painting a larger story with this couple than just some couple getting married. Perhaps they are both a couple, as well as the couple. Perhaps they are meant to represent Christ and his people. The identity of the couple is further illustrated by the nature of Jesus' miracle in this story. As with all the signs in John's Gospel, this one takes place upon the backdrop of Jewish religious ritual washing, of, a, of an institution of the Jewish religion. I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Throughout the first half of the book of John's Gospel, every time that we see a sign from Jesus, he's doing something. He's renewing something with the Jewish religion. He's come to fulfill, and more than fulfill, to, to overfill the Jewish religion with God's presence. And we're going to see that today. So six stone jars, each holding 30 gallons of water, are found. And the ceramic containers were stationary and used to practice a ritual, a ritual hand washing that, that symbolized being cleansed from your, your sin, your, your dirtiness. As the dirt and grime of a day's activities are removed from a Jew's hands, they are reminded of God's work cleansing them from sin. So this is, this is part of the Jewish uh, religious system, this washing, this regular washing. Yet, sin persisted with the Jewish people. Jewish lands were not only held hostage by Roman oppressors, but the Jewish people themselves were held hostage by disobedience and hypocrisy. Temple Judaism was corrupt and abusive, taking cues from their Roman occupants. Back when I was doing a sermon series on Mark, we discovered that there was actually a scam happening in the Jewish temple. People would bring their offering animals, lambs, uh, to, be, to be sacrificed. And what would happen is the priests would say, no, no, this is blemish. It's not good enough. You have to go buy another one. These poor families would be forced to, to spend an exorbitant amount of money in the marketplaces surrounding the temple so that they could offer sacrifice to God. It was a religious scam. It was a way to charge people way too much money for animal sacrifice. 
So the institution that was meant to reconcile God's people to God was broken. In that same way, the wedding in Cana was broken. What was meant to be a celebration of two people coming together in love, this, this, re this uniting and unity and love was now a scandal. The lack of the one threatened to rip the couple apart. It's possible that this wedding would never reach its climax and the couple would be separated. This is not the excitement of the end of the world. This is not the walls shaking and the floor trembling. This is the kind of mundane death that we all encounter every day. The kind of, of lack of life, the entropy, the disillusionment that we all encounter in our week to week, day to day life. These were impending realities that hung over the participants like a sickle. Death had drawn near in its menacing, but all too normal way. But what snatches my breath as I read this story is that some people still had hope. They didn't abandon hope. The wedding bells still rung, and the temple still received sacrifices. So Jesus walks into this situation, accosted by the urgency of the need of his people. This isn't to say that God in the flesh was surprised, so much as that he was impressed upon by the dire circumstances he found his people in. Upon his mother's observance that they had no more wine, which by now we, we understand a bit of baggage, Jesus replies, highlight his own absence. Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. In one sense, Jesus is totally correct to say this. In order for him to rescue broken humanity from all the corruption in, in individuals and in institutions, he has to make his way to the cross. He has to make his way there so that he can pay for our debt, so that he can rescue us of sin. It's a long, hard job, and it has no quick fixes. But by saying, my hour has not yet come, he seems to be giving in to the darkness of the moment, to the absence, to the, to the lack of the bride and the groom, to them not having any wine. The darkness seems to win for a moment, and he seems to be saying that he can't do anything about it. He encounters the lack of wine in the same way that he encounters the Jewish law when he visits the temple. It's run out. For Jews, the law was all about being reconciled to God. It was all about man and God coming together in this beautiful unity and a harmony. And man's sin corrupted that. The appetite of man for sin had turned but once flowed in rivers and gave life into old wash water. They couldn't fix anything. Yet the coming sign points to the whole of what Jesus has arrived to accomplish. Not merely to refill cups of wine, not just to get this Jewish sacrificial system working again, but to provide a superabundance of it, that it spills over and flows freely. He's come to do something better, something more. He's come to transform an imminent divorce into a marriage. He's come bearing hope for the hopeless as a light in a dark place. When Jesus says, my hour is not yet come, he tells the truth. He's not yet defeated darkness. He's not climbed onto that cross and fought his good fight. Even now, we still find this battle hard fought and seldom glorious. But pay attention to the way that Jesus fights this. He does not rail against the injustice of the wedding industry, nor does he tear down the Jewish temple brick by brick. 
Instead, Jesus offers us a sign. He offers us a sign that the broken religion of a broken people is being transfigured. He offers us a sign that while the wedding expectations aren't fair, God has great grace to meet our couple in the midst of their need. What better picture of this reality than wine? As an early Christian reader of the Gospel of John, wine could only direct our imaginations to one thing. Any guesses as to what that is? Any guesses? Communion? Communion. Yes, that is the right answer. Communion. In early Christian worship, wine reminds Christians of Jesus' blood spilt in place of a sacrificial lamb that would atone for sin. Jesus will eventually replace the Jewish sacrificial system and restore the hearts of a society that rips marriages, families, and people Heart. And communion is a sign of the unity that the life of Christ rescues us into on the cross. It's a picture of the God Messiah washing the sin of his bride away with his blood and rescuing her from her inadequacies. What is more is that despite Jesus saying, my hour has not yet come, his hour does visit the, the world at this moment when he turns water into wine. He's not on the cross, and yet it, it still manages to come back and, and, and do something for this situation, which is absolutely mind-blowing. Merely the sign of Jesus' resurrection work in the world provides enough light that the wedding is rescued. The promised hour reaches back through time and resurrects our broken bodies in a moment of despair. Promised hour shines like dawn into the blackness of night. So the question that I have for us today is this. Where has your wine ran out? Where have you run out of wine? Perhaps Jesus' words that my time has not yet come echoes a kind of abandonment by God in your pain, in your lack of wine. Or perhaps there is wine in your life, but it's just wine. And if it's ever anything more, it's an anesthetic for the pain that you feel. With this in mind, God comes to us as an embodied human being and asks us to drink this in remembrance of me. Communion is a remembering, literally reconnecting to Jesus' personal and life-giving presence. This is, why we this is why communion is central to our practice as a church. By remembering Jesus' physical presence among us, we are directed to his spiritual presence in us. Communion is hope in a reality beyond the present darkness that lights up the darkness. Much like the sunrise illuminates our faces long before dawn has arrived. Communion is like the head of a river which has begun to flow long before it relieves a land of drought. A river through which the kingdom of God flows into us, changes us, and changes the times in which we live. Jesus flowed into a conversation I was having with a friend this week. He was Catholic, and we were sitting on his patio drinking wine. And we were discussing the ways in which evangelicalism had become kind of straight-laced and legalistic in some ways. And uh, it was in this conversation that he said, uh, he said something that, uh, when I was raised, I, I often uh, heard stories about Catholics being very, very loose with their drinking habits. And so he said something that I took as, as kind of stereotypical. Uh, he said, evangelicals are too straight-laced. Catholics will get drunk right after a baptism because at the end of the day, we're just people. And what struck me about that was that for him, wine had become anesthetic. It, 
It wasn't anything more than wine. It was just there to kind of dull the pain. I'm not saying that straight-laced legalism is better. I think high-horsed self-righteousness is its own kind of wine that we can get drunk off of. Drunk on self-righteousness. But, but surely, surely, Jesus offers us something other than hedonism or self-righteousness. At our worst, I think that as Christians we become intoxicated. Either on wine as an anesthetic, just dulls our pain, or on self-righteousness. You become a wedding without a bride or a groom, or a temple with no salvation. But what our story tells us today is that Jesus is coming to our mindless wedding. He's stepping into our addictions and our self-righteousness, and he's giving us himself. This is light in the darkness. This is our hope as Christians. That Jesus is working in us and with us. And by God's grace, sometimes he even works through us. And that is his good wine. And he has saved the best wine until now. This week, as we go, I just want to invite you to ponder. Where, where am I lacking wine? Where... Where have my expectations and my hopes fallen short? Where are the places where outside of divine intervention, there is no hope? I want to invite you to ponder that and to ask, how is Jesus transforming my darkness through hope? How is his presence in those moments transforming me? How does it transform? Let's pray. Jesus, you, you came to us in the darkness. You came to us when there was no hope, when we had failed to be righteous, when our escapes had become empty, and you poured us a cup that overflows with goodness, with joy. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would receive this, this overflowing cup of your spirit. That your presence in us and with us would transform us and transfigure us as a church. As we look forward to a future that is full of questions. I ask that, that your spirit would guide us, but also bless us, bless us with, with countless joys, and that we would have the eyes to see and ears to hear what is good, your presence. We would see that, that you are good. You are the light in the midst of our darkness. Teach us to find hope there, Lord. Teach us to find your way. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.